Hello? Hello? Please, I know you can hear us. We are trapped here in the spaces between worlds. It is a wonderful yet terrifying place. And only our voices escape. You can help us. You can let us in. Before we... Before we go mad. <laughs>
The tracks were heavy, and the occasional drop of blood showed bright in stark contrast with the snow. How in the hell was he still going? I forced myself to slow down. After what I judged to be another eighth of a mile or so, I still hadn't come upon my trophy. Then I heard the first knock, a sharp, crisp sound of wood on wood, close enough and loud enough to scare the piss out of me. I froze, except for my head that swiveled wildly back and forth atop my shoulders. The sound seemed to come from the woods to my right, but I couldn't be sure. The air was clear and dry. The sound traveled unnaturally, echoing off the surrounding trees. I could only hear my labored breathing and my heart thumping in my chest. The woods had gone eerily quiet. No cough from the crows, no chatter from the squirrels in the trees. All ceased the second the knock had sounded. I told myself I was being silly. Yet the stories of Sasquatch, missing hunters, hikers, and campers permeated the local lore of the woods I was hunting in. I levered a cartridge into the chamber of my thirty odd six. I felt marginally better and shoved such nonsense to the back of my mind. Bigfoot was a myth and people went missing in the wilderness all the time. It was a large and scary place, not meant for the faint of heart. Over my many years spent in the woods, I had seen and heard some strange shit. My down-to-earth practicality had always overcome such experiences. This situation was no different. Quickly, I was absorbed with my mission once more. That damn buck had to be here somewhere. I crept another few yards beside the trail. The tracks were still heavy, but the blood had disappeared. I was feeling mighty discouraged when I saw where the buck had finally gone down, and for more than a minute or two. The snow had melted beneath him, and I felt a swell of hope when I saw the plate-sized patch of blood that had seeped from his wound. What in the hell was keeping him going? The wind was in my favor, and I was traveling at a snail's pace. There was no way I could have spooked him. Besides, by this time he shouldn't have had any strength left to get up. I let out a disgruntled sigh. My breath escaped as a plume of white exhaust. Despite the cool temp, I was working up a lather. I began thinking about stripping some layers when I saw what I had somehow missed. Suddenly I was cold again. Some mighty big tracks had approached the small circle of melted snow and blood. Grizzly. Even as the thought crossed my mind, I knew it was wrong. They'd be in hibernation by now, and these tracks were enormous. Bears get big in Montana, but not this damn big. The prints compressed the snow, crushing and melting it down to the frozen earth beneath. There were no claw marks. Instead, large toes and what I imagined to be gnarled and overgrown toenails outlined the top of the print. Whatever made these tracks, and I still refused to believe it was Bigfoot, was massive, and whatever it was, clearly walked upright. The wind shifted direction, and I caught a whiff of something far more powerful and foul than the faint aroma of the deer's scent glands. Dead flesh, skunk, and a few other things I couldn't quite figure. A sane man probably would have turned tail and beat a hasty retreat. However, my brain could not seem to grasp the reality of the situation. It was so unreal, I simply didn't believe it. Then, of course, there was just plain stubbornness and pride. I wouldn't let myself be scared off by an old wives' tale and lose the biggest buck of my hunting career. This was a once-in-a-lifetime rack for a guy like me. And damn it, he couldn't be too far. If something else got to him first, whatever it was, would have to deal with me and my thirty odd six. As the sun rose a bit higher in the sky, I decided that I had a boy who deserved a father he could be proud of. I'd find the buck and bring back them horns. I'd do it for Shane. I ain't gonna lie. Despite all of my determination, I was pretty shaken up. For the next fifty yards, I was Elmer Fudd, tiptoeing through the woods gun cradled in my arms and pointed straight ahead. Ready at any moment to pull up and blast that rascally wabbit, that monstrous big damn wabbit that walked on two legs and stunk to high heaven. After a while, I began to settle down again. There were no more footprints, no foul odors, and no knocks, only the hoof marks of my buck leading into a small clearing. I paused in the tree line as I painstakingly scrutinized the open expanse of tall dead grass, stumps, and bushes. Fully expecting to see a dead deer lying somewhere in the middle of it, disappointment was all I found. I shook my head, then caught another whiff of foul smell in air as a knock sounded behind me. This time it was followed by another answering knock. I spun around, rifle raised, scope to my eye. I peered through the magnified optics, frantically trying to spot whatever was making those knocks. 
I saw nothing as the knock sounded once more, and closer. The opportunity for retreat had passed. They were closing in on me from behind. I moved forward and began crossing the clearing. The horrific feeling that I was being herded like a lamb to slaughter was overwhelming. But what choice did I have? The buck was no longer my priority. Screw that deer. I'd cross the opening and make it into the trees on the other side before circling wide and beat footing it back the way I'd come. I was halfway there when I felt a blast of warm air. The atmosphere changed and I almost succumbed to a moment of sickening vertigo. I might have fallen if not for the crash of a large boulder hitting the earth beside me. Fear and adrenaline kept me on my feet as I began to sprint. I reached the trees and plunged into the woods, not stopping until I came to a ridiculously large uprooted tree, ducking behind the worm-like mass of roots and dirt. My breathing was heavy and uncontrolled. Fearing hypoventilating or having a heart attack, I forced myself to calm down. I had to think, damn it. Yet, as I managed to bring myself back from the brink of full-blown panic, another reality began to dawn on me, interrupting any plans for escape. I'd spent the better part of a decade exploring these woods, hunting, hiking, fishing. I knew every oddity and marker, every wonky-looking tree, every boulder stream and game trail. I had never come upon such a tree as the one I cowered behind. It just didn't exist in the woods I knew. The temperature was much warmer than it should be, and the snow was gone. From the looks of things, it had never been here at all. Where in the hell was I? I dug out my compass and found that it couldn't make up its mind. The arrow pivoted constantly between all four directions, as useless as tits on a bowl. Somewhere nearby a squirrel chattered, yet it wasn't the same chatter I had heard a thousand times before. A crow cod, not the familiar caw that I was accustomed to. They were different, low guttural, sinister, and otherworldly. Movement in the sky caught my eye as birds circled. They were big, god-awful big. Their wings spread wide to catch the air currents, and I guess the span to be close to twenty feet tip to tip. The feathers looked like armored plating seamlessly melded together. I could feel their large dark eyes staring down on me, as if I were nothing more than dead meat soon to be picked apart by their grotesque yellow beaks. My eyes darted about in search for an escape. The brush and undergrowth seemed too thick. The surrounding trees were large, growing in impossible U and S shapes. The exaggerated contortions of their trunks creating a daunting obstacle course. Awful mewling sounds, bordering on the verge of howls, came at me from all sides. The smell of ripe, rotting flesh was suddenly so strong, I began to puke up my meager breakfast of coffee and butter-coated toast. A tunnel through the brush magically opened, or had it been there all along? With little hesitation, I hunched over, holding my rifle low in front of me as I ran into it. The temperature grew even warmer as I traveled farther. My winter cap was snatched from my head by a low-hanging stick. Sweat poured into my eyes, blurring my vision. Yet I kept going, anything to get away from those wretched mewling sounds and putrid choking air. The tunnel began to narrow, forcing my progress to slow. As I wiped the sweat from my eyes, I was shocked to see the fresh hoof prints of a deer. Could it be my buck? A thin red smear of blood on a branch answered my question. I came out on the other end, standing on the precipice of a gently sloping hill, looking down on the depression of a small valley. It was green and lush, with tall grass and oversized wildflowers, their many iridescent colors almost too bright to look at. An immense grove of fir, larch, and tamarack trees formed a perimeter around the entire area. I heard the gurgle of water and turned to see a wide creek. The swiftly moving water spilled over boulders and fallen logs. It all should have been so inviting, yet it was all so wrong. The grass was sturdy and stiff, rather than soft and forgiving. The flower petals were thin, with razor-sharp edges, eager to cut at any fragile creature that dared walk too close. The trees grew helter-skelter, leaning this way and that. Instead of being bushy, the tops were perfectly precise triangles arrowhead points of green, orange, and yellow atop rough brown shafts. In the stream's waterfalls, I saw screaming, melting faces crashing together in the pools below, a frothy foam of never-ending torment. Every blade of grass, every tree, flower, and waterfall seemed to deny the world as I knew it, a pre-Adamite land, hostile and untamed. As if to confirm my theory, the same rumbling chatter I'd heard just before entering the tunnel filled the air with guttural vibrations. 
I glanced up to see a squirrel crouched on a tree branch. I called it a squirrel because it somewhat resembled what I knew a squirrel to be. But like the birds, the damn thing was way too big, its fur covering more like the tines of a porcupine than anything you might want to pet. Its wet yellow eyes stared at me in defiant challenge. The lips of the monstrosity sneered back to reveal needle-pointed fangs. A red forked tongue flicked out and back in, as if to add a flogging to its chattering disgust. I raised my rifle and stepped back, hoping to find shelter within the tunnel. Instead, my backside butted up against an impenetrable labyrinth of roots and thorns. In desperation, I placed the squirrel thing in my scope. Before I could squeeze the trigger, two honest-to-God Bigfoots appeared. They say seeing is believing, and I can tell you, brother, I believed. One grabbed the barrel of my gun, wrenched it from my hands, and bent it into a V before tossing it aside. The other yanked my hunting pack off and threw it in the same direction. My eyes grew wide and my legs went weak as I saw other backpacks and firearms strewing about, along with fishing poles, pots and pans, sleeping bags, and the occasional tattered tent. Some of the items looked fairly recent, while others looked incredibly old. My God, the stories were true. I would have collapsed then, but the Bigfoots grabbed me under my arms and began hauling me down the hill. Other Bigfoots emerged from the forest, carrying large dead logs in their massive arms smaller, identical creatures that could only be Bigfoot children tagged along. Their own arms cradled dry grass and sticks, all headed toward the center of the valley with their fire starting tender. Ah, hell, I moaned. Am I going to be Sasquatch stew or Bigfoot barbecue? Before I could ask, I was turned towards a structure that looked like a gigantic domed beaver den. It sat camouflaged within the trees, smoke wafting from a hole in the rounded rooftop. As we approached, a woman holding a staff of gray twisted root stepped out of the bizarre dwelling. She was enormous. Figuring the Bigfoots on either side of me to be over eight feet tall, I reckon this woman was ten feet tall if she was an inch. She was magnificent and terrifying, a hulking Amazonian queen ruling over this pre-Adamite world. She was garbed in nature, no animal skins, her dress all woven grasses, vines, and reeds. A large crown of thistles, dotted with purple flowers, adorned her head. Thick braided hair, the color of embers, draped heavily over her broad shoulders. I thought of biblical giants breeding with ninth-century Vikings. A white glowing orb the size of a beach ball hovered just behind her head. Other smaller orbs darted about her legs and in the grass around her bare feet. The Bigfoots fell to their knees, dragging me down with them. Their heads bowed low in reverence to their queen. There was much beauty, but no love in her face, as my upturned gaze met hers. I couldn't bear to look into her piercing emerald green eyes, so I too bowed my head, part in reverence and part in defeat. I heard a low, feminine rumble and realized she was speaking. I couldn't make heads or tails of what she was saying. Her language tribal and archaic within my ears. The softly glowing orb left her and floated down upon my head. Even as I was blinded by the white shimmering light, my brain began to translate her words. You are guilty of murder. You have killed one of our own. Not in self-defense, nor for food. You have killed simply for pleasure and for recognition. You have killed to boast and have a trophy to hang on your wall. You are without excuse or defense. You will get no trial. Your judgment came when you pulled the trigger. Her words hit me like a shotgun blast as I began to struggle and tried to speak. Large hairy hands clamped down painfully on my arms. The orb expanded down around my throat, choking off all hope of speech. I gargled and flailed, then hung limp between the beasts. The orb left me, once again taking up its spot behind its master's head. When the queen spoke again, I could no longer understand her, but knew that it was a command. I managed to raise my eyes as a small, ancient-looking man came out of the hut. His brown skin had long ago turned to leather, and he was naked except for the tanned hide that covered his privates. Pouches, also made of hide, dangled fatly around his waist. His dark hair was long and stringy. The top half of his face was painted red, the lower half black. Three eagle feathers stuck up from behind his head. He was chanting strange words as he approached me. Pausing an arm's length away, he dug a gnarled old hand into one of the pouches 
and removed a pinch of powder. Raising it to his lips, he stopped chanting and blew the unknown substance into my face. The Bigfoots allowed me to fall backwards to the earth as the world dissolved around me, melting and contorting into masses of strange shapes and nightmare illusions. Flying saucers zipped about in the sky above, and emotions began to overwhelm me as I writhed in terror on the ground. Happy, sad, pride, remorse, anger, fear. In an instant that felt like forever, I laughed and cried, I lived and died, and finally I screamed. I screamed as the Bigfoots yanked me to my feet, marching me towards the bonfire burning in the center of the valley. The Queen and the Medicine Man followed as the Bigfoots around the fire, both young and old, took up an ethereal chant some adding whoops and howls as knocking from the trees added a steady, rhythmic beat. Twilight was suddenly upon us, and I realized I had never seen a sun, nor did a moon appear to accompany the darkness. My eyes rolled madly, as great horned owls with the height of men and the girth of whiskey barrels appeared from the forest to stand guard as great black and gray sentinels. Their lantern-yellow eyes helped illuminate the growing darkness. I began to laugh wildly, when I saw my buck lying beside the jagged, flickering flames of the bonfire. Mortally wounded, he was somehow still alive. His chest heaved as he fought a losing battle for life. I was still laughing, as I was stripped of all my clothes and thrown down beside him, no longer able to move or speak. The queen ascended a staircase of stone and took her seat upon a granite throne flecked with specks of gold and silver that twinkled and flashed in the light of the fire. She towered over the proceedings as the medicine man stepped forth to lay hands upon me and my buck. His was the only voice still chanting, his ancient words spewing forth in a high-pitched, lilting cadence. He plunged a hand into another of the pouches. This time he threw an entire handful of green herbs onto both me and the buck. I felt as light as a feather as my spirit began to vacate my body. Within seconds I hovered above my prostrate form. My disembodied spirit cut loose from all physical moorings. The spirit of the buck departed from his body as well, his phosphorant white glow escaping as a balloon of floating mist that passed by mine on his way to take up a spot beside the queen. Before my spirit entered into the buck, I saw my empty carcass being thrown onto the fire. An angry red wound in my side seeped blood. I awoke beside the flames, life reincarnated. My new form was bulky, yet agile. I was covered in fur and walked on four legs. The heavy rack atop my head pulled down on the muscles of my neck, but was not a burden. My large black eyes saw every movement that didn't belong. My new nose smelled every threat. I was a beast, better equipped than I had ever been before. No, my mind screamed. I do not want this. The chanting ceased, and the queen spoke. This time... I understood her perfectly. Take him back from whence he came. Leave him to fend for himself. When he dies, his spirit will return to us, to be thrown into the waters of perpetual torment. What could only be called a cheer rose up as my Bigfoot escorts grabbed my antlers. I thought about the icy waters of the creek, the terrible screaming faces within. I tried to use my newfound strength to cast my captors off only to find I had no control over my new body. I was merely a disembodied spirit, trapped within the vessel of the buck. As they led me back up the hill, the portal began opening again, the roots and branches retreating like a movie in reverse, slithering back to reveal the passage. The Bigfoots chucked me in with such great force I stumbled and fell. When I stood up, the doorway was closed. And what if it wasn't? I couldn't stay unwanted in their world. I had killed one of their own. A pet? A friend? A wonderful creation they were duty-bound to protect? Was that what these massive, smelly tribal beings from another dimension were? Guardians of Earth's wildlife? I had broken a sacred rule, taking a life in unimaginable selfishness. My punishment? To now live as the hunted, not the hunter. Surviving by instinct and luck, for I would be afforded no protection, and when the end finally came, I would be offered no peace, only a misery I could not yet understand. I exited the tunnel, back into the woods I knew, or thought I knew, so well. Snow was on the ground, and evening was fast approaching. I walked with amazing agility and ease, my body working as one with the forested terrain. 
I should have been overwhelmed with my new array of super senses. Instead, my animal brain seemed to catalog everything it took in through the eyes, ears, and nose with mild interest. A flare of the nostrils, a flick of the ears, my brain registered back input. Black bear, about a half a mile away. Another flick of the ears, tearing apart a stump, no threat. An owl shifted in a nearby tree. My eyes located him instantly. A skunk was coming, still a ways off, but heading my way. Instinct moved me in the opposite direction. My mind had melded perfectly with the bucks. I could still think my human thoughts and reason as such, but my dear mind and body acted of their own accord. It was almost dark when I smelled a terrible smell. My human part didn't recognize, but the deer knew immediately. Danger. An awful primal fear rose within as I froze behind a bush, putting it between us and the horrendous odor of flesh, sweat, and human decay. This is what humans smell like? I had thought the Bigfoot smelled bad, but they were only everything of nature, both life and death. Humans, no matter how much they tried to mask it, were only death. I smelled and heard other deer. They were upwind of the human and sensed no danger. The doe was in heat and the buck following her was in the rut. Apparently the buck I inhabited was done running for the year, since neither smell compelled him into action. My God, was this how I was to spend the remainder of my days? What of my old life? What of my boy? Poor sweet Shane, could he overcome another blow in life? Or would this be the one to do him in? He had lost so much already and now I was gone too. I would be missing, but never found. There would be searches, and there would be rumors. Suicide would be high on the list. I prayed that my boy would never believe that I would leave him that way. God, please take care of my boy. A sharp crack sounded nearby, and I bolted from hiding. A wild carnival ride through the woods as I sprinted away from the shot. It was still dark outside as I checked my gear one last time before heading out. I paused when I came to my little baggie of fun-sized almond joys. I had always hated the small coconut-filled candy bars. Dad had loved them. So much I could never refuse when he offered me one. Hell, he thought I loved them damn things as much as he did. What's funny is, I actually do like them now. It's been a hell of a year. One year ago to the day since Dad went missing. I've been searching for him ever since, long after the search parties were called off. Every day off of work, every spare hour, I've relentlessly scoured the woods where his truck was found. I need answers. I need to know. Most of law enforcement and the locals have chalked it up to suicide. The poor alcoholic bastard finally broke. Never mind he hadn't had a drink in over two years. Never mind he had a job and a home. Never mind that he had a son. I refuse to believe that he abandoned me. Yet, the part of me that I hate keeps me awake at night wondering. Did he? I've struggled to come to peace with the fact that I may never know. And that he is really gone. My mission today, in remembrance of the old man, is to finally bag that big old buck. Everyone knows he wounded a large deer that day, and tracked it for a time before all of the tracks mysteriously disappeared. What they don't know is that buck is alive and well. I call it our buck. While searching for Dad, I've gotten to know our buck, his every habit and repetitious move. It's strange, but I've come to feel a kind of spiritual attachment towards him, as if we've been drawn together in this tragedy by some unknown force, inextricably hurting us towards an inevitable conclusion. This morning, I knew exactly where to hike in and post up. As I sat in our brush-covered blind, I remembered that Dad had wanted to wait. He didn't want our chance at the beautiful buck to be his alone, but work was work and I chose work convincing him to go without me. Why hadn't I gone? Just before first light, our buck appeared out of nowhere, about a hundred and fifty yards away. His rack was tall and wide, with drop tines and too many points to count. Boone and Crockett for sure. 
I calmly settled the crosshairs on his vitals and thought, This one's for you, Dad. I squeezed the trigger. 